All right, so FreeNAS 11 is out and I want to do a video, a little bit in depth, kind of going through the setup process, getting the shares going and basically getting set up. Now things I'm not going to cover is specifically going to be the uh, virtual machine inside of it, the Beehive hypervisor, because well, you can't do that in VirtualBox. So I gotta, uh, this will be a separate video because I gotta build a machine for it. And uh, I might just be reloading it on my computer, our server, I might upgrade to this because I feel so far it feels pretty stable. I'm gonna go over the settings real quick though of what I built here. So one network adapter and for storage, I created just a bunch of virtual disks. Now, obviously this is not at all a real world setup. This is completely just gonna be a demo setup. Uh, and the reason for that is obviously you don't run FreeNAS, it won't run properly in a virtualized environment. And all these disks are just, well, a bunch of virtual disks on one hard drive. So they don't really do a lot of good. So we're gonna go through the install process, actually make sure I got this set up. So FreeNAS and FreeNAS 11 release. There we go. And we're gonna start walking through the install process, which looks just like the previous versions of FreeNAS. Uh, pretty straightforward. I'm not gonna to get too in depth. I'm gonna just cover a couple of quick points inside of here. Install upgrade. Only for demonstration purposes, I went ahead and did this uh, where I have two of them because I do recommend, I mean, thumb drives are arbitrarily inexpensive. Um, and there's not a lot of read writes. I've seen people worried about failure on these. It's mostly read, push into memory, and then store all the data on the uh, RAID array itself. Uh, but it's still nice to have two of them and it will mirror them if you just select two different USB drives. So these little eight gigs represent USB drives. Now I did notice this, and I haven't done this on any real hardware. Uh, it detects the USB later, so it kind of overwrites onto the screen, which is kind of annoying. And it offers to do an upgrade install because I'd already installed this before, but I didn't wipe it. So I'm just gonna wipe it now and do a fresh install. Install, format the boot device, proceed with installation. Let me just set the password. Boot via BIOS because, well, we're in VirtualBox. Choose whatever works for you. I'm partial to the BIOS ones, but kind of depends on what your motherboard supports. So we're gonna let it run through here and almost fast forward all this. All right, and it's all set, it reboots, and we boot up into FreeNAS. Shut down. All right, so we have FreeNAS installed, but I canceled the wizard because, well, I don't care much for the wizard. Uh, I like to set everything manually, but there are a couple little housekeeping things I do. So we're gonna go over here to the advanced, and I turn on a couple things, which is the auto-tune, which auto-tune allows the system to put in some extra parameters that fall under tunables. Basically, I believe it's like a templating system. It goes, oh, you have this, this, and this, and we turn these features on. Uh, you can auto, uh, you can add features yourself, add system tunables, add custom uh, things to this. Most of the machines I've ever built have never had a problem just using the auto-tune features, and I've never tweaked it too far as the speed and function has been adequate, and uh, it seems to have never caused any stability problems. But, you know, mileage may vary. You may have some weird hardware configuration that you don't want to do that on, but I generally myself have not had a problem with it, but start there. If you weren't having problems and you turned on and had problems, start with that. Next, I like to turn on the show console messages in the footer. Now, the nice thing about this is you get this. So here are the console messages. So at any given time, you can watch them uh, roll across the bottom. And then if you just click on it, you can say, okay, you know what, I'm doing something. I wanna see what the console messages are. Cause maybe, you know, well, even right now, uh, I don't feel like pulling up another window or in my case, the machine is headless sitting in the back. Uh, so there's nothing on the screen. And, you know, you can always go back and look at them, but it's kind of nice to have them there. Now, besides that, uh, I do recommend putting a certificate in. Uh, I'm not gonna get in depth on that right now. Um, actually, I, I had some issues with it. With, I don't know if it's a FreeNAS 11 bug or a Chrome bug. Chrome doesn't like the self-signed cert on this anymore, and Firefox does. Uh, that's a separate issue. We're gonna focus today on getting your storage set up and getting some sharing done. So we're here at the storage. Now, there's a couple different places you see things. Uh, you may have noticed, this is just the way FreeNAS is set up and the new FreeNAS, I, I think the new interface makes more sense because uh, there's so much repetition, like things across the top and things across the side here. Uh, but this is, you know, the old interface still has all the functionality in it. Uh, 
So you can see your storage, but what you may not notice in here is you don't see the system volumes in there. And those are right here. So I went to system, boot, storage, and then you can see the boot mirror and tell you if those are online or healthy and you would get an alert over here if there was an alert if one of those had failed. This is your multiple USB drive boots. So that's under system again, boot, and then status. Now there's also a separate grub uh, under boot for the scrub to do the testing of it. So you can say you can scrub the boot. Um, you can also, as I got here, create, uh, create a new boot. And there's a history of all the installs and updates here. And this is actually let you uh, keep it, rename it, clone it, or even roll back to uh, one. So you can see initial install activate versus this is default right here. And you'll see a whole history of these in a system. Now this is my uh, office one right here and you can see that on reboot I'm doing this, but if I wanted to roll it back, I can actually activate this one and on reboot it would go back to a previous one. You can keep a few previous, all depends on how much storage you have available on there uh, to store it on the little thumb drives. Uh, you do have to go in here after you've done a bunch of updates and delete some of the old updates. Uh, that is another thing you can do. So back to the FreeNAS 11 system. So let's get to our storage. And as you see, we have no disks. Now you can, at this point, you can view the disks so you can see all the disks in here. There's no uh, smart management because these are all virtual drives like I showed you in the beginning. Uh, it tells you the size of each of the disks. It does have an option to wipe them in case you want to wipe them clean uh, before removal, for example. Um, we can import, if there was already a volume on here, you can say import some of these into an existing volume but we're not importing anything. And it's like if you set up a new FreeNAS, you load it, but you were pulling the drives out of another FreeNAS, you can actually pull an array and import it in. So we're gonna go to Volume Manager here, and we're gonna create our test volume. I really recommend enabling encryption. Now the reason for this is with the encryption, you have the ability to swap a drive out and send it back without worrying about what data is on there. Now we keep customer data on the drive, so when drives go bad, and eventually they will, you don't want to have to worry about the data on there going, man, you know, it seems to not read properly, but man, I got a lot of data and it's hard to erase, um, but I want to send it in because I had a warranty. Use encryption, keep peace of mind. The encryption does not really add anything in terms of overhead. It's really simple. Uh, if you use the basic encryption, not the passphrase one, the passphrase one adds another layer of you have to put a passphrase in every time it boots, but this creates a key file that's stored on the USB drive to decrypt the volume on boot. That way, if you have to pull any drive out, you can send it back and no worries about that. Now, here's where we choose our RAID configurations and there's different options in here. We have RAID Z, RAID Z2, RAID Z3, just a simple mirror. And you can drag the drives around for different mirroring or striping options. So if we drag them like this, they're gonna be a stripe. We do them like this. We can still set up RAID Z because it's a pair of drives each one. And this is changing how you mirror the drives. Or we can drag them, I think it's like this here. So by dragging them around, you can choose the different options. So this would be, so you can create a mirrored set between the drives, so one and two in a mirrored set, or we can drag them all this way and just let RAID Z figure it out. I'm really partial to the RAID Z, uh, especially like the Z2. Now that's gonna give you, out of this pool, it's gonna give you two drive failure redundancy because it creates parity data across all the drives. Now, because of the way software RAID works, and it's a lot better than hardware RAID, especially here in 2017, it spreads it across the drives in a much more intelligent way using the ZFS system. So if a drive fails, we can rebuild it. If two drives fail out of this, we can rebuild it. When you do a RAID Z, you get more capacity, but there's not enough parity created across the drives. So if one drive fails, you don't lose the array, you can rebuild it. Downside being on the rebuild process, you're stressing all the other drives. And let's say you have a couple from a similar batch. Maybe that one is close to failure because one of them was. Well, now you're stressing it, trying to rebuild the array. It fails on the rebuild process and maybe you lose your array. Uh, so all depends on just how critical the data is and how much capacity you're willing to sacrifice for redundancy and 
whether or not you went through the trouble to build maybe a second entire array for backing all of this up or you're backing it up in an, in an offsite server. Either way, these are all some considerations. You can read in detail elsewhere about all the different functions of the RAID-Z and RAID-Z2. But for purposes of this, we're just going to set up as a RAID-Z2 system. So now we're going to add the test volume here. All right, it's created. And you can see in here some of the things like, for example, it says, hey, it can't load smart. Well, that's because you can't run smart on virtual hard drives. They don't have a smart status. Anyways, so we have our volume. And now we have the key option here for creating a passphrase. If you wanted it more secure, we have to put a passphrase to unlock it every time on boot. Or you can simply just download the key. So we provide the root password and download the key. Now, downloading the key is extra important, and it's a very tiny file called geli.key. And what this key file is, is it's stored on the USB drives. If those USB drives go away, they fry, they die, you lose all the encrypted volume. That's it, nothing you can do about it. There's no recovering from it. You don't have that key with that data in there. You are not going to be able to recover that. So. You want to make sure you back that up. Now, I don't know why, and it maybe should be a warning message, but whenever you're over here on general and you do a save config, uh, you know, once you get it all set up, you can back up all your configuration settings. It doesn't back up that key. And to my knowledge, they didn't change that in FreeNAS 11 here either. Uh, so when you do the backups of the system, the key still is separate. I wish it popped up with maybe a warning. Maybe they're changing that in FreeNAS 11 where you can download it, but I didn't see anything in the documentation that said that. Uh, but I know in previous versions of FreeNAS, it was not. So here's your uh, volume and here's your data set that's underneath it. Now, for each volume, we create a data set. Now, maybe you can say, I just want to dump everything to one data set. It's just me using it. I just want to use a big storage server. You can do that. You can control a single data set. Ideally, from a structural standpoint, you want to set up individual data sets under this. So here's the test volume. And then we're going to create a data set, which is this button down here. And this will be our first data set. All right, we're going to go ahead and make this a Windows compatible share, and we're going to add the data set. We're going to add another one. Now, you can make data sets that are subsets of other data sets, but for this, we're just going to create another one, second data set. All right, same thing. We'll make it a Windows share, add data set. Now, for each of these data sets, for example, with the test volume here, if I wanted to create a snapshot and I see recursive snapshot, it's going to snapshot all the data sets that are under here. We're going to cover snapshots after we throw some data on so I can actually show you how they work. So here's this data set. And for each data set, they have their own permissions. So here's the permissions we can set. We can set the group and the owner. And maybe you want to create a data set because you want to use a set of files and you have another person that wants to use a set of files. Uh, then you would then go in here and let's create a user called Tom so we can show you how we set the permissions on there because it's an important part of getting all this set up. So we're going to users, add user, set user Tom. All right, and hit OK. Pretty straightforward. Now we have a user, Tom, who we can assign permissions to. So we go back over to storage, and we're going to give uh, there. As a matter of fact, let's just create a whole separate one again and call it Tom's data set. So we'll Tom's data goes here. Tom's data. It's going to be a Windows share, so we'll do this. Then we're going to go here, permissions. Who's the owner? We're going to say Tom. The users show up at the top. These are some of the built-in accounts. I like the fact that it adds the users to the top, makes it a little bit easier. So we're going to go ahead and change the owner to Tom. So Tom gets to own this data in here. All right, now this allowed us to create a data set called Tom, but there's still not any actual sharing occurring here. A couple things we need for that. We need a share first. So we're going to create a window share, add window share, path, mount, test volume, Tom's data. There's 
There's the share name. Now, if we want to turn on guest permissions, you can do that, which allows guest browsing of it. We wanted password permissions, so we're just going to do it this way. It says, would you like to start the service? Yes, we would. Uh, that is the SMB service, and we can configure that here. This is where you can rename things for the SMB. Uh, if there's any specific things you want to set up in here, the defaults are pretty straightforward. Uh, you do have to change a lot of these things if you're doing an Active Directory authentication. Uh, I've done one, I've done a few, they're complicated. Um, I've run into some little hiccups with it. Uh, maybe I'll do a separate video on it, but um, there's some guides that are really good at step by step because it involves uh, creating objects and reverse DNS and PTI records inside the Active Directory to point to the FreeNAS box to basically allow it to handle all the permissions for all the users in Active Directory. Uh, it's like I said, I don't do it very often. Uh, a lot of these are standalone uh, boxes, so there's not not really been as much of an issue to set those up. Uh, but there's some really good guides right in the forum on how to set up FreeNAS on uh, Active Directory, and they're they're very accurate. All right, so now we have sharing enabled we've got the service enabled for sharing. I also turned on SSH um, in case everyone SSH into the box. So SMB is turned on, that's turned on, it's checked start on boot. Now let's go to the drive and see if it works. Okay, SMB 3.34, Tom's data. And we made the username Tom, I have a password on that. And Tom has access to it. So there we go. There's test, another test. And as simple as that, I have a password protected folder that I have access to. So how does it look in Windows? Let's cover that real quick. Here it is in Windows. So we can go here and I typed in slash slash and it's uh, dot 34. Whoops, typed in four. So slash slash 192.168.3.34, we go here, put in the password, and here we go. Another test, and you can see that it works perfectly fine. Now, when it comes to security, this is where without Active Directory, you don't get to pull if you had an Active Directory, which there isn't on this machine, um, when you're trying to edit permissions or create other users, there's no interactivity for that. But you can kind of get the idea, that's how it works. Now you can also, in FreeNAS, let me shut this down now. Now if you wanted to add other users, that's where the grouping system comes in. I'm not gonna get into all the details of the permissions, but in short, you could actually create a security group there's already a group named Tom, but you call a group called Share Group, and then you would add each of the users. Let me show you the user directories here. And then you would say, you would create that group and then say, okay, uh, other people need to belong to this group, and then you can actually group share out a folder that way. And you're letting FreeNAS handle all the permissions for Windows at that point. It does support it. You can't even set up hierarchies. We've got a couple clients that do that. Um, they've created different groups like accounting and HR and used it without any Active Directory integration at that point, uh, which is, you know, it's convenient. They only have a couple people working there. They have a FreeNAS box. They have it backed up. And... It, it's a fine solution without having to put a Windows machine in there, so they have local storage uh, that they have shared between a couple people. So, now that we've covered basically how to create a share, let's show you what some of these other ones look like. So, here's the one called Tom's Data. Now, we can create another data set underneath there. So, we'll call it Nested Data. Keep following the Windows pattern here. There's our Nested Data Set. And this is how it shows up in here. So now we have test, another test, couple of folders I created, and we have nested data. This is a data set, not just a folder, but as far as to the way you see it, it just shows up as a folder, which is pretty cool. Uh, and the reason why is this is, we're gonna play with snapshots in this nested data set. Now you can play with it at any level, but let's just start right here to give you an idea. See, the snapshots are a huge, important piece of how FreeNAS works in terms of, you know, uh, being able to manage data and being able to uh, roll things back and forth. This is a feature and probably a big reason you'd want this. So let's just dump some data here. 
Oh, I didn't set permissions for this. Go back in here. Change it to Tom recursively. All right, now the nested data is owned by Tom. And I pasted some files in here. So let's paste some other randomness in here that I have. All right, so we have a few files in here. And what we're going to do is go to this, and we're going to create a snapshot of this nested data. So create a snapshot. It doesn't need to be recursive because there's nothing else underneath it. So mainly create the snapshot. So then we can take a look. Here's our snapshot that we have. No used data, but it refers to 115, mix, 115 megs of data that I have in there. So let's go in and delete the data. Or let's move it somewhere else. So we're going to go to a new folder. And we're going to take this data, drop it in here, and we're going to delete some of it. So we've completely changed around. We've created a subfolder. Uh, we've dropped out some of the data in there. Now we can see that we've used some space. And the reason we've used some space is because, well, we've changed the files in there. So the snapshot was a reference to how it was then. And we have the option to destroy the snapshot, clone the snapshot, or roll back. So let's roll it back. Are you sure you want to roll back? Yep, let's roll it back. Done. Instant. Very fast. And it's even on large data sets. It rolls back really fast. It's pretty slick. So we go over here, and we're going to have to go out, do a quick refresh. It's exactly how we left it. I instantly rolled it back that fast. And that's how snapshots work. Now, if we did it recursively, and let's go back over here to our uh, volumes, and we're going to do the entirety of it, create a snapshot recursively. Oh, we already have one. So let's go ahead and it gave me an error because I have this one here. Let's go ahead and delete this snapshot because we're trying to recursively create a snapshot that we already have in here. So we got to start at the beginning for that one. So go to volumes. Test volumes, create snapshot of all the things, create snapshot, and we can go snapshots. And here it did create a recursive one for all of the different volumes that are in here. So this now is a state of each one of these, and you can see how much data was used. And as you move forward, all the data is only stored in here based on the changes it takes. This is what makes Snapshot really efficient. Maybe there's not a lot of changes, there's only some changes. And this is what saves some people from things like CryptoLocker, because if you get CryptoLockered and you're using ZFS and you have like a daily snapshot, you're like, oh no, I got CryptoLockered. I can just go back to tomorrow's snapshot. Let me go ahead and destroy this. And the way you do that is you set up periodic snapshot tests. So we can actually set it up for the entirety of the volume so everything gets snapshotted, or we can say just one of them gets snapshotted. And if we do this one here, we say recursive. How long should it last? One week, two weeks? We're going to keep one week of snapshots. When should it occur? What should the interval be? Daily. By default, you can do one every, um, it, what was it set at, like one hour? But you can change these to every five minutes. So you can literally keep these incremental snapshots ongoing constantly, which is really awesome. This is a really nice feature. Um, and then you say begin time and end time. Only run snapshots during business hours, for example, because, well, that's the only time you're creating data. Or you can say one time a day, and it's going to start at 9, make sure it's over by then, um, including Saturday, and it'll create these snapshots. And we're just uh, to keep it clean, we're going to do just the nested data one here. So we're going to play with just that one. But I could do it on any one of these, and it doesn't need to be recursive. So we're going to go ahead and do this. Hit OK. It's enabled. Keep snapshot from one seek frequency one day. So then when you go over here to snapshots, it's going to take a minute, but it'll eventually start creating the snapshots, and it'll have a snapshot in there. So pretty slick the way it works. Let's play with a little bit more advanced features on the snapshots themselves. So we're going to go ahead and delete this. So we only have the snapshots we want in here. Go to volumes. Go to nested data. And 
And as you can see, we saw the same data in there as we, we did it. But let's do something a little different. So we're going to dump some more data in here. A couple more random things we threw in here. And then we are going to, uh, let's say, uh, delete this. Well, move into a new folder again. We'll just move just this and that into this folder. Oh, skip. There we go. Accidentally selected folder. So now we've made some changes. Now, this is one of those things that come up. So we go over here to snapshots. Whoop, let's create it real quick. So we go, we'll create the snapshot. Manual create snapshot. Yep. Then we're going to go back over to here. And we're going to delete a couple things. We'll just change this one to a different name. So we've done the changes. And let's say you have a user who created a bunch of data. So you don't just want to restore it. You're like, oh, I need to restore the data. But that someone else already created a bunch of data in there. This is where snapshots have another feature that's really cool. We can clone the snapshot. So we can say, bring me back to the time here. So we'll clone snapshot. So clone must be on the same volume. Tom's data, nested data, manual clone. We're going to call it nested data manual restore. And we're going to say clone snapshot. And I'll show you what this does here. We go back over to our volumes. We have yet another nested volume under here. Now, what this allowed us to do was create a clone of the data. So we go back here and refresh this. So here's a clone of it. So then I can go through, find these files I wanted, put them back where they belong over here. And then when you're done, you can just destroy the clone. And OK, I'm done with this. I copied the files I wanted. I put them back. I've solved the problem you know, from the users that created the issue. And then we can just go ahead and destroy the data set. And now with very simple, without having to do a bunch of restore features, refresh it real quick we're able to restore things back to normal. So this is one of the advantages of snapshots. You can take these snapshots and when you have a folder and you can create maybe a really you know high value folder where you know there's a lot of activity that you know this might occur in, this is a really simple way to do it. So you just go here, you set it up to be manually snapshotting, especially if you have a folder where a lot of people are constantly creating a lot of data and you're like, you know, if you have five users using a pool of data in there, but one user screws a bunch of stuff up and needs to go back to earlier, but the other users don't, that's where you can just restore a clone of the system, copy just that person's files back to where they want without disturbing the other users, and then destroy that snapshot. And this is just, an, a, to me, just a beautiful feature of the entirety of the FreeNAS system being able to do this. Now I'm going to show you our production system real quick. Here's what it looks like as we're adding data in our production system to, for example, for sync thing. I have this set up to do daily snapshots and keep some, uh, I think I got a weekly snapshot. Yeah, weekly snapshot on here. And the reason why is when you're using sync thing, it's similar to Dropbox. If I change something on one file, it propagates to my offsite servers and my in-house computers. That being said with that it would propagate badly if I screwed something up. So by keeping snapshots of it, I can just roll back if I needed to or even clone it and do the same thing I just showed you guys. Uh, what's really cool too is you can have filters in here because if you look at this with everything in here, snapshots we've done, we clear these. And we're going to go show all. There's a lot of data in here. So you can filter for date. You can filter for manual snapshots you've done. Uh, this is kind of a neat tool to be able to do that. And you can see how much data they're taking up. And if you want to get rid of any of them, because like this one takes up too much data, you know, it, it can get rid of it. Also, you can see the variations in data as it's being copied. So this one here was a 74 megs copied or down here. And these are sortable. You can sort by, for example, clear this real quick, sort by how much data was used in the snapshot, sort by how much it was for reference. So, or the snapshot name makes it really handy to find things, uh, sort by available actions, and sort by replication if you're using that. And we'll talk about replication next real quick. So ZFS, because of all this wonderful snapshotting features and all these, how do I back it all up? Now, someone's asked me, is it just a file 
when it does this. No, it's function of the file system. So how do you back up all these cool snapshots and everything? Because you can't just sync them. They're not exactly data. They're functions of the file system. And I'll be able to do a whole video on this, but you can add a replication task to another ZFS volume. So you can actually create a snapshot of the volume itself. So you set up a periodic snapshot of my test volume. So we can create a snapshot or as periodic ones, we'll just show you real quick. So here's the entire test volume recursively. We only want to keep it, let's say for one week at a time, just like before. Then we go into replication tasks, add a replication task. And what this does is takes that volume data set, the remote volume data set, including you can do all the what they refer to as the child data sets of it. And you can sync the entirety of the file system, including the status of the snapshot. So if you're in a high availability uh, system, you got really redundant. You don't want your system just backed up. You want all the snapshots backed up so you can roll them back at any time. You can duplicate the entirety of the ZFS system. So the entire file system can be synced up with another NAS, another free NAS box, put them in sync with each other, including all the snapshots. So everything you do on the schedule you set gets duplicated, including all of your snapshots and file sets. So uh, it's just such a powerful feature in here and it kind of blows my mind just how well it works. And I haven't really ever had any major catastrophes, but I've had times when you want a data back and I've never had a problem. Snapshot, hit it, boom, restore, uh, create a quick volume set, or in our example here, how we did it, how we have one that is like a nested data set, you can create another nested data set under this data set and copy the files you wanted without disrupting the intact data. Like I said, for example, you know, when you wanted to over someone overwrite one thing. So pretty impressive how that works. So that kind of covers getting started with your first share uh, and how the snapshot works and just kind of an overview of some of the advantages of the ZFS file system, especially, you know, this cool uh, snapshotting system you get and doing data sets or nested data sets or replication. Now, I know a lot of you probably want to know about all the plugins available for free NAS or some of the, uh, j how the jail system works. I may do some separate videos on that. I'm not the most clear on how they're being you know, handled in here. Now, the jails is a function of FreeBSD. It basically is similar to Docker. It's not like a full-blown hypervisor, but it creates essentially a jailed version so you can run something within it. Uh, we're using this a little bit, but now that they've integrated the whole Beehive VM, which is an entire hypervisor, which is it, you can virtualize the whole operating system and run other operating systems within it, I'm not sure if they're gonna be doing away with the jails. Now, the concept was they would have these plugins and they would run inside of jails and everything is sandboxed, so to speak. And But I don't think there was enough development for it. Uh, I know that they tried bringing Docker in for the version 10, the Corral version of FreeNAS. I don't know if they're going to eliminate this or where these are on the path, really. Uh, but I may do some separate videos on the plugins. I'm definitely going to do a separate one of VM, but I have to build an entire machine for that. Now, let's talk about a little bit of the functions of FreeNAS and how it works, especially the memory. This causes some confusion for people. You can see I've got 8 gigs allocated, but I'm not quite using all the 8 gigs. And what's going on here is FreeNAS will use all the memory that you give to it. So we're going to go jump over to my production machine again so I can show you a few things. So this machine has 12 gigs of RAM. FreeNAS will use pretty much all the memory you can give it. So if I were to put 64 gigs in this machine, even though it doesn't have that big of a storage array, it will fill the memory up with caching information. So especially the read caches, this is what brings people to the controversial thing about ECC memory going, there's a lot of the file system data hold, held in memory. What if the memory gets corrupted? That is a risk. Uh, I still have not ever had a problem not using ECC. Do it at your own risk. ECC is a error correction type memory and some people go, you have to have it. Uh, FreeNAS does CRC checking before each of these writes gets committed. So I feel secure that even if the memory were to somehow have a bit flipped that didn't crash the OS, it magically was able to flip something in memory that didn't cause any other things to uh, function, that the CRC system would fix it before it ever wrote to the file system corrupted. But 
all comes down to what level of risk are you willing to take with anything. Uh, so that's kind of my summary on the memory. What's the level of risk you're willing to take? What's the percentage of it happening? I see less than a 1% chance of that happening, so I don't go with ECC. Back to the memory itself, you will see it utilizing as much memory as it can. So if there's a lot of files, there's a lot of reading, writing back and forth. It's going to utilize the memory to put it all into RAM, the entirety of the uh, ZFS all the different uh, write commits and everything like that uh, th to make it more efficient. So if you memory starve one, you get low performance, but there's kind of a diminishing return. It will use it, but you can't say, I can't go from 32 gigs to 64 gigs and say it's going to double the performance, right? No, not really. Uh, there is a point of return and roughly they're saying one gig per terabyte of storage, but beyond that, you know, it's not really that big of a deal. I do have, like I said, here's the plugins and more specifically the jails. I only have one thing running in the jail. And you can see 3.4 is my free NAS box and 3.240 is my clone deploy. One of the interesting things about the jails is they are separate and they get separate IP addresses. Maybe they said I'll do another video specifically on that. So, but you can see in reporting, the partition target, you get CFS data on here, arc size, uh, which is some of the request this is for the caches um let's see if we zoom out a little bit you can see where there were changes made based on data being pulled back and forth when we were dumping massive amounts of data system processes depending on what you're using this for uh we're only running clone deploy and just clone deploy and ZFS free NAS itself on here. So the CPU usage is super low on this. Uh, our system is a AMD A6. Not had any problems with it. It's nothing really beefy. Uh, the heaviest intense thing running and even the load average being high in it is because of the volume of data that we actually back up and synchronize on here. So we have all of our business data on here and all the server data on here all encrypted. And then we synchronize it off site with another server. So uh, doing that and we do it on a every 15 minute basis, it looks for any new changes and synchronizes them off site for database changes. So it does keep the system more slightly higher load, um, but it's really not. Yeah, it's not enough that it's causing any delays or anything like that. And that is what you'll run into. If you do short memory on here, you can run into corruption problems. And if you try to run it with, I don't even know if it will run anymore with FreeNAS 11 with less than eight gigs, but one of the concerns you are gonna have is it will cause a lot of issues. If the system wait time is because it's swapping between basically a swap file and trying to keep things in memory, you have what they call IO wait times. The IO is constantly waiting on the memory to feed it and you will end up with possible corruption because it's just this constant wait, 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 and the system's going to be very, very slow when that's happening. So, but uh, that was the overview of getting FreeNAS 11 set up and getting your first share set up on there. That was really the uh, bigger goal here and kind of giving an idea of the ZFS file system and how it works along with the snapshot ability of the file system. Uh, like I said, that's a huge, great feature of it, being able to do the snapshots. And I'll probably do some more videos uh, coming along. I said, I'm going to build a specific, I got to physically, I have a, a parts laying around on the other room uh, so I can build one just so I can test the VM and the hypervisor because I want to get into playing with that. Cause I, I really like the idea of building that and having all those snapshot abilities on there. Uh, you know, built into free now. So I think that's pretty cool. So if you like the content in here, like, and subscribe, uh, Hopefully I got it all right here on FreeNAS and uh, FreeNAS 11. I may have missed a couple things, but I'll be doing some more videos and more follow-ups on FreeNAS 11. Uh, thanks for watching. Appreciate it.